Oh God, help us to listen to your word with understanding, to receive it with faith, and to obey it with courage. For Jesus Christ's sake, amen. In Luke chapter 2, we hear the verse, For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Today we honor Mary because she was the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ and because the Gospels testify that she was a virgin when she conceived and gave birth to the Son of God. One of the features of Luke's gospel is the prominence of women in the gospel story and the vital part they played in bringing our Lord Jesus Christ to us. Luke reveals in chapter 1 how the Lord chose two women for the beginning of the gospel. The song of Mary, which is so familiar to us, was spoken by Mary when she visited her cousin Elizabeth, who was bearing a child in her old age. Here we have two women, one elderly and one in her mid-teens. Socially, they were far removed from each other as they were in age. One well-established, married to a wealthy priest, the other engaged to a humble village carpenter. These two related physically were also related spiritually in a remarkable secret which they shared for months before anyone else would come to know that one bore John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, and the other bore the Son of God. Why would a young teenage girl make the long journey on foot from her home in Nazareth over 80 miles to visit her son in a little village called Ein Kerem on the outskirts of Jerusalem? Have you ever thought about that? Well, she went to see if it could possibly be true that her elderly cousin was with child. That teenage girl was thinking over that incredible experience in which an angel came to her and told her, you are going to bear the Son of God. The angel said, if you want proof, your elderly cousin is bearing a child in her old age. And Mary had to go and see for herself if what the angel told her was true. In the moment when the two women see each other, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she began to speak in a loud voice, not a quiet, small voice, but a loud cry of excitement. When we're excited, we tend to speak loudly, right? And so out came the most wonderful words. Up to this moment, Elizabeth had no idea what happened to Mary. But now, through the Holy Spirit, she understands what she had not known before. She is now prophesying when she says, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. The Jews understood for centuries the Old Testament prophecy that the Messiah, the promised one of God, was coming, a savior, a deliverer, someone who would fulfill the dreams of his people. Every Jewish girl had one ambition, to be the mother of that Messiah. They knew that one day a Jewish girl would give birth to a Jewish boy who would be the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. 
the prophet Malachi proclaimed that not only would God send the Messiah, but he would send a messenger before him to prepare his way. And now Elizabeth knows that in her womb is that messenger who would be named John, and we know him as John the Baptist. Can you imagine the feeling in their hearts and the realization of what was happening, of who they carried within their wombs? You know, their hearts must have been filled with overflowing, or maybe they skipped a beat. And so Elizabeth says, congratulations, how blessed you are, and how blessed is the fruit of your womb. Elizabeth is the first person to call Jesus Lord. She calls Mary the mother of my Lord. And so we carry great respect for her as the mother of our Lord Jesus. And when Mary walked into Elizabeth's house that day, the unborn child jumped or leaped in Elizabeth's womb, and Elizabeth knew that it was Mary who would give birth to the Son of God, the Messiah. And what is Mary's response? Well, she is thrilled because she believes in her heart without a doubt that the word of God has come true. The real secret of joy is faith. Mary knows the truth of the word spoken by the angel. And now she has confirmation, as Elizabeth is with child in her old age. And the baby leaps inside her womb. Are we as thrilled that everything God says will come true? Do we believe the truth that Jesus came at Christmas went to a cross on Good Friday, was raised at Easter, ascended into heaven, and one day will return? Do we believe that? Are we excited to think that we are nearer to his second coming than to his first coming? How do we know that he is coming again? Well, we have nothing but his word to believe it. Our joy is based on our faith. Elizabeth's joy is contagious, and Mary responds with praise. Now, one person's joy-filled heart moves another's. Praise is infectious. As we think about that, you know, during this pandemic, No one wants to be infected by COVID-19 or any of its variants. But if only everyone could be infected with praising God. If one person speaks words of praise, that will move others to do so also. And now Mary is full to overflowing and a song of praise flows out of her mouth, and we know it as the Magnificat. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord. And to magnify means to get a bigger view, to enlarge your vision of God. How large is your God? Is he small? Do you expect just small things? Or is he a large God? And do you expect great things? Like the children's song, our God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing our God cannot do. And of course, we sing many hymns that refer to the greatness of God. You know, the hymn, How Great Thou Art. And Mary sings in in the Magnificat, For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Mary's song has been sung for 2,000 years, and it is filled 
with scripture. It especially echoes the song of Hannah, another woman who did not expect to have a baby. But Hannah prayed to God and God answered her prayer. And she gave birth to a son and named him Samuel. The same Holy Spirit inspired both the song of Hannah and the song of Mary. And notice that this song is not about Mary, it's about who? It's all about God. God is mentioned 15 times in this little psalm of praise. And I want to highlight one thing that Mary says about God. She points to God's generosity, his grace. She says, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Mary recognizes that she is a lowly sinner saved by God's grace. And like Mary, we too are saved by God through grace. We don't have to work for it. It's through his generosity. Grace was upon Mary so that God would look with favor upon her to become the mother of our Lord. And if God will do that for Mary, what will he do for you and me? It is exciting to watch, to see what God is about to do in our lives. Mary remained with Elizabeth for three months and then returned to her home. And it must be that the conception took place while she stayed with Elizabeth. She would return to her hometown where she was a subject of gossip and where Joseph resolved to divorce her quietly. Mary does not try to explain herself to anyone. She simply trusts God. Who would understand if she were to say, well, while I was away, the Holy Spirit visited me? No, she left it to God to explain the meaning, to do the explaining. Do we trust God to work things out in our lives? Are we trusting him now? We all have different circumstances that we're dealing with in life, and are we trusting that to God and let him work it out? As we think about Mary and Elizabeth, we see how God's Holy Spirit dealt with these two women and changed the course of history. That's how God works. He sends his Holy Spirit upon ordinary folks and plants within them that which will fulfill his purpose. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Holy God, we are amazed at the possibilities you can plant in our ordinary lives. That you can use ordinary folks like ourselves. And yet our fear is that there are those who cannot be used because they do not believe and trust in you and therefore do not have the joy. Lord, may we be willing to be filled with your Holy Spirit to do and to be and to say whatever you wish. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.